Solitaire Rose Radio, episode 39, an introduction to the works of writer Don McGregor. Last week at the San Diego Comic Con, Don McGregor won the Bill Finger Award. The Bill Finger Award for Excellence in Comic Book Writing is an award to recognize writers for a body of work that has not received its rightful reward or and or recognition. That is what Jerry Robinson intended as his way of remembering his friend Bill Finger. Bill Finger is kind of the industry poster boy for writers not receiving proper reward or recognition. Bill Finger worked under Bob Kane, was thought of to be the creator of many of the parts of Batman that still endure, and yet he received no credit and, from all indications, received poor pay. The award is um, chosen by committee. They choose a deceased writer and a living writer every year who they feel embodies that, and this last year, Don McGregor won. Don McGregor is one of my favorite writers. I have met him a couple of times. I met him in 85 at the Chicago Comic Convention, and then again in 2001 at the San Diego Comic Convention. Both times he was kind, he was appreciative, he was fun to talk to, he kind of snuck my self and the woman I was seeing in 1985 into the Marvel party where we sat at a table with a few other people and talked writing for, geez, over an hour, maybe two. But here's the thing about Don McGregor. When I was 12, I was given Jungle Action number 17, which was the last part of the very long Panther's Rage storyline. And it was like nothing else I'd ever read in comics. Most comics at the time were written in kind of a faux Stan Lee style, where the narration was kind of over the top, a little melodramatic, and would address the reader personally. Don's was different. Don was like reading a novel in that he would set tone with the narration. He would describe what's going on that you can't see. He would give the type of social commentary, much like a Travis McGee novel by John D. MacDonald. All of these things were wrapped up in these stories that weren't just about the superhero action, but also about the consequences of the violence that caused it. When people came into conflict, it wasn't the conflict happened and then, then they it came to resolution and went away. The conflict brought with it consequence. Physical consequence, emotional consequence, and it was something I had not read in comic books before. And let's remember I was 12. I hadn't read a lot of crime fiction. I hadn't read a lot of adult fiction. I was still moving from sort of the things you read when you're young into the juvenile realm of science fiction. And they call it juvenile realm because they're they're novels basically written for you know, young teenagers. Don was almost my introduction to that world. I became a huge fan and followed everything he did from then on. I was able to find the Kill Raven series he'd done. I found that he'd written a few issues of uh, Luke Cage Power Man. At the time he had also written some stuff for the Marvel Black and Whites, but I couldn't get the Marvel Black and Whites. And like most creators at the time, he when he left Marvel, I didn't know what had happened. It's like, oh, he's not working at Marvel anymore. And then Marvel started running ads for a graphic novel he'd written, and I couldn't afford it until later. But Don's work at that young age kind of was one of the things that sort of brought me from reading things as a child to reading things with a more mature perspective. And I've always followed his work, and his work has always been one of those that I pick up immediately. So the fact that he won this award makes me very happy, not just for him, but for the fact that it's going to draw more people to the work that he has done. 
Don McGregor actually started as a comic book fan. He wrote letters to early Marvel. Some of them were printed, but he his letters were like a lot of the fans at the time. They were sort of written in a more literary style than, I like this comic, this comic's cool. He would talk about the, the, the underpinnings of the story in his letters. His first real published work was a self-published fanzine in 1969 for the characters Detectives Incorporated. Detectives Incorporated was in some ways kind of his reaction to the TV shows that he loved at the time. He was a huge fan of I Spy. He liked the detective shows like that. And one of the things that is kind of interesting is he self-published this, took it to the New York Comic Convention to sell it. But he also had created the characters. He had also created the characters for himself and one of his friends to play in a series of eight millimeter films that he shot. So in many ways, the characters of Ted Denning and Bob Rainier, who are the detectives in Detective Incorporated, were not just comic book characters, but he also wanted to bring them into movies. And I have not been able to get my hands on a copy of this uh, self-printed story. Um, Don doesn't have copies of it available either. But that was sort of his first attempt at doing that sort of thing. Another thing he was doing around the same time, he was still writing letters, and he wrote letters to the Warren magazines, basically talking about how the quality had dropped off a cliff, and he could write better stories, to which the editors at Warren, of course, went, if you think you can write better stories, then write them. And he did. And starting around issue 50 of Creepy, they started publishing his stories. And while the stories are still you can read the stories and they're still entertaining you can still tell that it's someone who's learning how to write someone who's learning how to put things together and especially in comics learning the balance between letting the art show and letting the words tell the story he's still trying to find that balance however he does find it very early on in these stories and as he's writing, each story that he writes for Warren is just a little bit better, a little more well-formed, but you can still see that style of writing he has. Yes, Don is very verbose, but he also uses it to create insight so that it's not just a horror story, it's not just a superhero story, it's not just a twist ending story. He's trying to grasp at something deeper and in those early stories his grasp really out is outpaces his reach but he's trying to do better he's trying to learn more and as he worked there freelance eventually he was able to get a job at Marvel as they called them assistant editors at the time but really it was just kind of a, a proofreading job and he would go through the, the scripts before they were lettered to make sure that things were spelled right, that everything was in the right place, to make sure that the character names were correct. And that was kind of what the assistant editors did. And as he worked through there, Marvel was also publishing short, little short horror stories at the time in their color comics as well. And Don was able to grab a few assignments of those. He then moved into doing more assistant editing on the black and white magazines where he actually had his name in the credits as being an assistant editor. And from what Don has said, he did a decent enough job that when he said he really didn't feel like he was getting paid enough to continue to live as he was living, one of the, the editor-in-chief at the time Roy Thomas said, well, one of the things we do for our assistant editors is we give them writing assignments to sort of make up for that income. And coming out of our last editorial meeting, we have decided to give you two assignments, one of which was Black Panther and one of which was Kill Raven. Black Panther had not been in a comic before. Black Panther was a supporting character that had been created in the Fantastic Four and then quickly moved over to the Avengers. And the book that it was to appear in was Jungle Action. Jungle Action was part of Marvel's early 70s flood the market strategy where they just, because DC was no longer controlling how many books they would publish and because Atlas Seaboard 
was trying to gain a foothold in the market. Atlas Seaboard was the publishing company created by Martin Goodman, who used to be the owner of Marvel. Then he sold it, thinking that his son would be able to remain in charge of Marvel. And as soon as they could, the new owners dumped his son. So he started a new comic book publishing company called Atlas because he'd had that name for years and years and years as his distributorship. And what Marvel did is what Marvel did whenever they could. It's, oh, there's if one is good, 30 is better. Flood the market. And one of the books they flooded the market with was Jungle Action, which reprinted a lot of the 50s Marvel um, jungle stories with their Tarzan knockoff and their Sheena Queen of the Jungle knockoff and, and characters like that. And McGregor was the one who was putting it together, doing the proofreading, re- taking out a page if needed. And he said that the stories were really kind of offensive and very dated because it was the white jungle, the white um, the white character who comes in and saves the jungle and knows better than the people who lives there live there and knows better than the basically it's the, the the same complaint people have about the early Tarzan stuff where is you know the, the, this is a savage land and a white man must tame it so when Don McGregor was given Black Panther Black Panther was a character we knew something about he was a king in a country called Wakanda he had come to the US one of the problems with the character was that they had completely gotten away from the fact that he was a king in this country in Africa this hidden country that had the world supply of vibrantium so here in the darkest part of Africa is this highly advanced hidden civilization which was one of Jack Kirby's favorite things to go to was the highly advanced civilization hiding away from the rest of the world and what McGregor did is he brought him back and he embarked upon this long story and at the time Marvel didn't like long stories especially in a bi-monthly magazine so what McGregor had to do was construct each story as if it was self-contained but it would have threads that would pull through and the story was set in Wakanda there were no white characters there was none of the sort of black exploitation stuff that was going on at the time with Shaft and Superfly and drug pushers and pimps and and all that he wrote the Black Panther using Kirby's template of this king this warrior king in an advanced civilization and the story was that there was a struggle for the for the control of this country with uh, Eric Killmonger wanting to take over this land and exploit the riches but it wasn't some white man coming in to do it no Eric Killmonger was African and the story lasted from issue 5 to issue 17 so that's a 12 part story and it wasn't until parts 3, 4, and 5 that McGregor kind of led on that it was going to be continued so you had McGregor taking the stuff that Kirby had put in it and putting it into a more real world context making the characters seem more grounded one of the things that I love about Kirby is all of his characters seem very big and very mythic what Don did was he took the setting and all of the ideas and he didn't invalidate any of it but he made the Black Panther a real man in a fantasy world dealing with human emotion dealing with the consequence of action dealing with the consequence of violence Um, when a minor character was killed to advance the plot it didn't read like and then the spy you know it it wasn't a throwaway it was the emotional crux of the entire issue and here's a character that we hadn't seen much of before very minor character and his death meant as much as any other part of the story the other big thing about Black Panther was the book did not sell well because well it's jungle action with the Black Panther, a character who's not very well known, 
not one of the core Marvel characters, and it's also a bi-monthly book. And when a book was bi-monthly at Marvel in the 70s, that mean it didn't sell very well. They wanted to keep it on the stands another month and hopefully generate some more sales. So the budget on it was very small. It was supposed to have reprint backups, which don't cost anything so that the book would make budget and one of the things that Don would do on his own time for no pay would be to create sort of bonus features maps um, histories insights into how Wakanda worked making it feel even more like he had created this very real environment in sort of this fantasy setting and the letters pages reflected the amount of, of detail and work and almost poetry that he put into the superhero genre in that the letters were much more well written, they were much more literate than other letters. And at the time Marvel had very literate letters pages. But Don was able to elicit a higher grade of letter from his readers because he was putting out a higher grade of comic book story. His run on Black Panther after this end after the uh, Panther's Rage story ended what Don tells is that he was told by Marvel that he needed to bring the Panther back to the United States and he needed to put white people in the book. That One of the problems is none of the characters were right so white readers won't buy it. I was white I couldn't have been more white. You know, some 12-year-old in Fairview, Illinois, out in the middle of nowhere, I couldn't have been more Caucasian, and I loved this book. Not just because of Don's writing, not just because the Black Panther was cool, but also because it was introducing me to this world I knew very, very little about. I knew next to nothing about Africa. I knew next to nothing about warrior kings. I knew next to nothing about these cultures that he was bringing and infusing with such respect. And, and the Panther, the Black Panther as a character demanded respect by the way he walked, by the way he acted. It wasn't a shaft, superfly sort of thing. He had an innate dignity because he is a warrior king. He was written and drawn as a warrior king. The character came about as he is a king. Shown by his actions, shown by how he treated others around him, very much a case of show don't tell. So what he did, he brought the Black Panther back to the United States, put him in New York, and had a story about the Ku Klux Klan. And Don said that at the time Marvel didn't use real sort of things. Instead of the Ku Klux Klan, the Klan, they would use the Serpent Squad or you know some fantasy version of it so that they would be just a little bit removed. And if somebody said, you're, you're mocking the Ku Klux Klan, they go, no, 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 this is a villainous group. But also, McGregor was kind of called on the carpet by some of the editors at Marvel saying, um we don't want you to do this story about the Ku Klux Klan and McGregor's answer was you told me you wanted more white people in the book the Panther vs. the Klan story was cancelled due to low sales and it was cancelled before Don had a chance to end the story and you could tell by reading the last page of it that he knew that this was happening and he wanted to give sort of a writer's commentary so I'm just going to read from it here Sometimes it ends more quickly than you imagined, without answers. The wooden wheel splinters as he surges through the water and into the air. The two men face each other. The one at the cliff's edge questions his purpose. Below, the panther waits. And that's how it ended. That's how the story ended. That's how the series ended. And Don was never able to actually complete the story. When they did complete the story, it was by a different writer who turned it into more of a superhero story rather than dealing with, as I always say, the Black Panther was a real man in an all-too-real world. The other thing McGregor was doing at the time was Kill Raven. Kill Raven had started as a sequel to War of the Worlds, set in the year 2019, where Kill Raven... I'm sorry, what a 
goofy imagey name. Killraven was a gladiator in the Martian pits who was able to escape and had become a freedom fighter and along the way gathered up companions. McGregor came onto the book after it had been handed off from writer to writer to writer to writer. Um, it was originally Roy Thomas and then Gary Conway and then Marv Wolfman. And then when Don McGregor came on, he, he again shifted the series. He kept the idea that Earth had actually been conquered by the Martians and that they were in charge. And he kept the supporting characters and immediately began adding depth to them. Immediately began adding more to them where they weren't just the quick stereotype. They had a history. They had a past. They had a way of looking at things. They had a purpose in the story and a purpose in the group. And it became very much about Killraven and this family he had gathered going on a quest through the United States after the Martians have taken over on a quest to find his brother. And very soon they added P. Craig Russell as artist. And at this point, Killraven went from a action-adventure science fiction series, again, to something more. McGregor would pull out real science fiction type ideas but he would infuse these characters with so much depth and there was so you wanted just to see the characters interacting you wanted just to read about their lives and and how they related to each other but then you would get these wonderful science fiction ideas on top of it and of course because it's about a band of people trying to overthrow invaders you had a lot of the subtext of what was going on in America through the 60s and into the 70s and how sort of there was a feeling that the revolution had failed and was falling apart. It has been collected only in a Marvel Essential and most of the time I love the Essentials but the problem is with P. Craig Russell's coloring once he gets on the book, the very light lines that he used for inking, the, the brilliant coloring that he used, just makes the, the, the essential look muddy. Normally I would recommend pick up the essential, but on these, no, go pick up the back issues because you want to you wanna see just how beautiful this artwork is with on top of it Don's prose that is getting better with each issue, which is getting more evocative with each issue. He's growing as he does these series. He also did a few issues of Luke Cage Power Man, and Luke Cage Power Man, if you read the early issues of that, that is Marvel's attempt at a black exploitation book. That is Shaft, Superfly, uh, Pusher Man, Dolomite. The, the entire origin of, of uh, Luke Cage is he's, he's in jail for a crime he doesn't commit, but if he submits to the scientific experiments, he'll be released. And now he's, you know, a hero for hire. He only takes on jobs he gets paid for. When McGregor stepped in, he only did a few issues. And a couple of the things strike me about it. One is Don Camp put together a good superhero action story all of these issues were good superhero action stories but he also does this wonderful running gag about the soda machine in the hallway and whenever Luke Cage goes to use it it screws up in some way and it's a long it's a running gag it's a long burn of a gag and every time you see him oh I need to go get a soda you're actually you don't laugh out loud because you're reading in silence, but you start to get anticipation of, oh, how's it going to screw up this time? To me, it really showed that Don had a gift for taking a character who's just a stereotype and, and very surface level, one-dimensional, and making that character interesting by putting him into interesting stories and looking for ways to add He only did a few issues of Luke Cage Power Man, and they are reprinted in a number of places. The Black Panther stuff he did in Jungle Action has been reprinted in a Marvel Masterwork, which may be the 
best of the Marvel Masterworks. It has the entire run. It has page after page after page after page of extra material from Don's files. And then it has a foreword by him and an afterword by comic writer Dwayne McDuffie, which I will get to later. But Don's books did not sell very well. And at the end of the series, he left Marvel. And over at Eclipse, he put together a graphic novel called Saber. It was Don McGregor and Paul Galassi. It used a lot of the same sort of idea as Kill Raven in that it's a dystopian future, America has fallen apart. And Saber is a very different character. It was creator-owned. And it came out before Will Eisner's uh, graphic novel. And in some ways, a lot of people say this was the first creator-owned graphic novel. And while I don't want to get into the arguments as to who, what, when, where, and why, this is one of the earliest graphic novels. It's a 48-page, and it was published in the same way as the European comic albums. Larger size, glossier paper. And it did well enough that years later, when the independent comics boom started, it was turned into a series, the first two issues of with which reprinted the graphic novel, and then the series continued from there. Don did some other stuff for Eclipse as well, including a printing of a completely new version of Detectives Incorporated, using the same characters with art by Marshall Rogers. And it just showed how good Marshall Rogers was at the time at not just telling a story, but also using the comic page to sort of build mood and, and do more than a film could do. This was also the first time in mainstream comics that there was a story involving lesbians that were, you know, where it was actually said that they were lesbians. McGregor put this out. He did another Detectives Incorporated story as well. He also did a series of short stories in Eclipse magazine under Ragamuffins, which was about children in the early 60s. These stories were by Gene Colan. Gene Colan had worked on some Kill Raven with him, and this was sort of Gene Colan's first work at an indie. He was no longer under contract to Marvel. He was working for DC, but he also did these Ragamuffin stories. And the Ragamuffin stories are going to be reprinted very soon by IDW, I think it is. But McGregor announced that they're going to do a full reprinting of all the Ragamuffin stories, including some work that was never published at the time. So as he transitioned to independent comics, he was doing much more personal work. Saber was a very personal story. And at the core of Saber, even though there was all this action-adventure going on, Saber was a love story. It also had the first on-panel birth before Alan Moore did it a couple years later in Miracle Man. I have said a number of times that Saber is one of my favorite love stories in any medium. And going back and reading it, again, the art suffers a bit from the coloring at the time because the coloring in these books they were still trying to learn how to color on the the Baxter paper which didn't absorb the ink as well so some of the pages look very gaudy some of it the the color overwhelms the art itself but the story itself sadly remains unfinished but every issue brings more to the story. There are layers of social commentary, layers of emotion, layers making this a more and more real world. And then in 1984, McGregor returned to sort of mainstream comics by doing two miniseries over at DC with his detective character, Nathaniel Dusk. Nathaniel Dusk was a character set in the 30s, a private detective, pretty much from the Raymond Chandler National Hammett genre. But the thing that was so innovative about this story was that they printed it directly from Gene Colan's pencils. Normally in comics, they, the 
penciler gives the stuff to the inker the inker goes over it with ink so that it shows up better on on the printed page and with this the printing had gotten good enough that they felt they could print the story directly from Colin's pencils and it was colored the first one was in a more muted tone to really highlight Gene Colin's pencils and showed what we'd seen that Gene Colin was a master of shadow and a master of movement and a master of shade in a way that we hadn't seen before this was some of Colin's best art and some of McGregor's best writing because there were four issues four issue stories um, the first one was regular comic size the second was almost double size issues set around real events and around real people's problems and real people's issues Nathaniel Dusk was very much a character that I come to expect when I read Don McGregor a little melancholy a little wistful very romantic um, does the right thing even though it costs him emotionally mentally and physically these have not been reprinted but you can find them in back issues these are highly highly recommended especially the second series because it's on even better paper and it's longer but both of them together work exceedingly well and I wish at some point DC would reprint this in a nice hardcover volume after those two um, stories wrapped up he didn't really do much else for DC kind of faded out of comics for a bit came back and did a two-part spider-man story about guns but what happened was in um, when 1988 when Marvel started Marvel Comics Presents McGregor was asked to come back to the Black Panther now other writers had finished up his Panther vs. the Klan story but the next story that McGregor was going to do after he finished his Klan story in Jungle Action was a story of the Black Panther trying to rescue his mother from apartheid South Africa and he had done a lot of research on this um, in interviews he's talked about how he would really sort of halfway plotted it out in his head and that was going to be his next Black Panther story so Marvel Comics Presents was an anthology it was going to have four eight page stories some of which would be one shot so some of which would be continued Don was there in the first issue and he and Gene Colan started a Black Panther story that was 25 parts long sadly it has not been reprinted anywhere I think it would make a wonderful one volume book but it's still set in South Africa it shows Don's attention to detail it also shows how Don used the consequences of violence in every way possible it wasn't okay here's a fight scene and two pages later everybody's fine no when someone gets hurt they're hurt it shows the after effects and in some ways it makes the violence harder to to read but in a lot of ways you feel that it should be like that it should hurt the Black Panther isn't you know invulnerable he can't fly he's just a very very well-trained athlete who puts his body on the line again the warrior king the story went through all 25 issues it was very well received to the point where Don McGregor next did a four-part prestige Black Panther story picking up on a number of the threads that he had had in the jungle action stories where it led up to the Black Panther was going to marry his longtime girlfriend from McGregor's time Monica Lynn and then there was not a follow-up series to that I don't know if it's because it didn't sell well I don't know if it was because of Marvel regime change I really don't know what happened but McGregor has said a number of times that he had that story in his head ready to go the contracts were being worked on when when it kind of all fell apart which is a damn shame one of the things that you hear about McGregor at Marvel is that there were things like that where he had almost put the deal together and it fell apart with Killraven after the series was canceled the fifth Marvel graphic novel which was their series of the album size 
48 pagers was Kill Raven. And it was by himself and Pete Craig Russell. And it dealt with Kill Raven finally getting to his brother at Cape Canaveral. And McGregor introduces a older female astronaut who's one of my favorite characters not just that McGregor's done but to overall just such a wonderful wonderful character and the art on the glossy paper with Pete Craig Russell doing all of it including coloring is amazing you look at it in the pages with that fine ink line with that just very delicate coloring I remember when I first picked it up, I, I wanted to read it because it's Don McGregor and he's back on Kill Raven. But I started looking through and it was one of the few books where I just looked through the art and I just wanted to see each page. And I looked at it that way before I went back and read it. And there was going to be a conclusion to the Kill Raven story. But what happened was that Marvel could not promise P. Craig Russell that it would get the best possible publishing at the time. So again, the deal fell apart. This brings us up to the mid-90s. McGregor's um, Black Panther four-issue prestige series was in the mid-90s. And McGregor then moved over to Tops, which was publishing comics, and started work on a character that in many ways he's synonymous with if you're a reader from that time, and that is Zorro. He did a Zorro series. I gotta be honest, I never cared about Zorro. I never was interested in the character. I'd seen it on you know, the wonderful world of Disney. But it's Don McGregor. I gotta pick it up. It's Don McGregor. And he made me fall in love with Zorro. He made me fall in love with that character. He also kind of answered the whole bad girl craze of the 90s with a spin-off character named Lady Rawhide who dressed very provocatively and, and had the, the, the covers like that. But McGregor put together a story reason for her to look like that. And she wasn't just a, a you know a comic book female with huge boobs. She was a character with dignity and respect and, and that sort of innate heroism that McGregor brings to all of his characters where they have this heroic aspect to them where they have to overcome not just the obstacles but their own inner obstacles to continue along this path to take the consequences and continue to move forward which if you look at McGregor's work all of them have that theme all of them continue to hit with that and that was really kind of the last major series that Don McGregor has done he also did the Zorro daily comic strip for a while which has been collected a few times and Don McGregor is still trying to put things together. A couple of years ago, he put together a Kickstarter to bring back Saber and finish the Saber story. It didn't meet its goal, but I saw a lot of the preliminary work that he and artist Trevor, Mc Trevor Von Eden had done. And I hope that at some point he's able to put together some sort of deal to keep doing this. Don is still there. He's still active. If you go to his website, he points you toward essays he does about the characters and TV shows that he's loved. I Spy, Hopalong Cassidy, um, 77 Sunset Strip. His essays get to sort of the heart of why he likes these things and how they influenced his writing. But one of the things about Don McGregor is how he influenced other writers. If you look at his sales figures and you look at the number of books he's done there are other people who sold more books from the same time there are other people who had longer runs on characters there are other people who really kind of did more but if you look at the people he influenced Don McGregor was the first person to write an interracial kiss in a mainstream comic book he was the first person to show a birth in a comic book. He was the first person to have um, a lesbian relationship, especially one that wasn't exploitive or un kind of seedy. And this was in the early 80s when such things still weren't really talked about much. Or if they were, it was about titillation or demeaning that lifestyle. He presented 
all of his characters as real human beings with good points and bad points and characters who who maybe made mistakes and sometimes learned from them and sometimes didn't. Neil Gaiman said in a recent interview that Don McGregor is the one who taught him that you can do poetry in comic books. There are other writers who've said often that McGregor showed them that comic books can be more than just action adventure stories. But what I want to read is Dwayne McDuffie's essay from the Black Panther Masterbook. Dwayne McDuffie was an African-American comic book writer. He also moved over and worked in um, animation. And he's one of the best writers that ever worked in comics. He also was involved in the forming of Milestone, which was a company that promised to kind of bring multiculturalism to comics. It wasn't just, here's a bunch of all new heroes. It's, okay, here's an African-American hero. Here's an Asian hero. Here's, you know, it's sort of reflecting the world that Dwayne McDuffie knew. And also to sort of reach out to minority readers and people who want to read comics, but every character's a white guy and the one black guy's in the back of the room or, you know, he's somebody's sidekick. So I want to read this afterward by Dwayne McDuffie because I think it really gets to the core of why I like Don McGregor, but also it gets to the core of why Don McGregor was important and why the things that he wrote matter. Sometime during the summer of 1973, I was in my backyard pretending to be Dr. J, an endeavor requiring great imagination on my, on my part, as I was too small to even palm a basketball, much less dunk one. My best friend, Alan Thumpkin, interrupted my pathetic fantasies of athletic glory with an important news in the real world. The Hulk's gonna fight Thor! It's supposed to be out already! If Alan said so, it must be true. He knew more about comic books than anybody in the whole neighborhood. Even though my interest in the subject was, at the time, a good deal less fanatical than Alan's, this was definitely worth checking out. Much of our rapidly dwindling summer vacation had been spent in heated arguments over who would emerge victorious in such a contest. I was quite certain that the Incredible Hulk would have no problem beating up a little guy who dresses in a cape and wears feathers in his hat. Alan, however, favored Thor, citing the Asgardians' mighty Uru hammer and mystical control over the weather as the likely decisive factors. Maybe so, but then Alan preferred Frazier to Muhammad Ali. The definitive answer to our debate was suddenly at hand. Only one obstacle remained. Lindsay Drugs, the good comic store, was over three miles from my house, and I was expressly forbidden from riding my bike in the street. Nevertheless, I concocted a clever story to cover my illicit tracks. I'm going over to Alan's, okay? Mom went for it. Alan and I hopped on our bikes and made for the long ride. We ran into the drugstore and scanned all three of the comic racks. The Hulk vs. Thor comic was nowhere to be found. Alan consoled himself with a bag of Gold Rush bubblegum, which was pretty cool because the gum looked like little gold nuggets, and it came in a cloth sack that you could keep marvels and stuff in after you ate all the gum. I had 20 cents burning a hole in my pocket and was determined to buy a comic book. As it turned out, I'm very glad I did. The comic I settled on was Jungle Action Number 6. It featured a superhero I'd never heard of called the Black Panther, but then I'd never heard of the Black Panther political party either. The questionable taste of a Black Panther being the lead in a book called Jungle Action escaped me completely. What didn't escape me was the dignity of the characters inside. I was instantly and hopelessly hooked. The Panther wasn't the first black character I'd seen in comics. Blacks had already appeared in crowd scenes and even occasionally as supporting characters. Although he was new to me, the Panther first appeared in the Fantastic Four. Here was even one black character who starred in his own monthly comic, Marvel's Luke Cage Hero for Hire, had been running for over a year when I first discovered Jungle Action. But I never connected with Cage, the bastard child of 10,000 black exploitation movies, a super strong, angry black man who wore chains by choice, didn't seem particularly bright, and spoke in a bizarre version of street slang that didn't remotely resemble the speech of any black people I knew. Spider-Man made sense to me. Cage? What can I say? I just couldn't relate. In those days, when black characters in comics weren't b busy being angry, they appeared either as faithful sidekicks or worse, as helpless victims who begged white superheroes to rescue them. How come you never did nothing for the black skins, Mr. Green Lantern? 
and this was actually considered progress. The Black Panther was nobody's sidekick, and if there was any rescuing to do, he'd take care of it himself, thank you. Moreover, the Black Panther was a king of a mythical African country where black people were visible in every position in society. Soldier, doctor, philosopher, sweet sweeper, ambassador. Suddenly, everything was possible. Before my astonished eyes, in the space of 15 pages, black people moved from invisible to inevitable. I'd spoken ad nauseum about the importance of multiculturalism in fiction and life. I'd preached about the sense of validation a child feels when they see their image reflected heroically in mass media. That particular summer afternoon, reading about the dastardly but nuanced Eric Killmonger's villainous plot to usurp the Black Panther's rightful throne was precisely when I felt that sense of validation. I realized that these stories could be about me, that I could be a hero too. Years later, writing in my own comic, I described that wonderful feeling of the sudden possibility of flight. The creation of Milestone Comics was, among many other things, an attempt to pass that feeling along. It was about gaining the high ground, about gaining a perspective that allows you to see the many possibilities open to you. That issue of Jungle Action single-handedly revealed to me that there were new heights to reach, new vistas to view. It also not incidentally, entertained the hell out of me. Thank you, Don McGregor. What I didn't know at the time was that terrific comic I'd bought, and it turned out paid for. My mother wasn't actually fooled by my going over to Alan's ruse. When I returned from the store, she put me on no comics punishment for an agonizing two weeks. It was only the beginning of an unprecedented multi-part epic called The Panther's Rage. For 13 bi-monthly issues, over the course of nearly three years, yeah, I know, let's just say that Marvel wasn't exactly a stickler for shipping dates back in the 70s. Aided and abetted by a number of exceptionally talented artists, including the late great Billy Graham, The Panther's Rage was everything a superhero comic should be. This overlooked and underrated classic is arguably the most tightly written multi-part superhero epic ever. You just read it so you know. You just read it so you know I'm not exaggerating when I say it's damn near flawless. Every issue, every scene is a functional necessary part of the whole. Now go back and read any individual issue. You'll find in seamless integrated words and pictures clearly introduced characters and situations, a concise sometimes even transparent recap, beautifully developed character relationships and at least, and at least one cool new villain. A stunning action set piece to test our hero's skills and resolve, a story that is always moving forward toward a definite and satisfying conclusion. That's what we all should be delivering every single month. Don and company did it in only a relative handful of story pages per issues. Compare this to the bloated, empty, ill-planned story arcs you see in many of today's comics. Six 22-page issues to tell about two issues worth of story seems about par. Ah, but now I'm just bitching. I followed Don's work and became a hardcore fan, first to the Panther, then Marvel, finally of the Medium. Meanwhile, Don McGregor spent the next 40 years continually challenging the limits of that medium by producing gems including Killraven, Detectives Incorporated, Saber, Ragamuffins, Nathaniel Dusk, Zorro, and Lady Rawhide. Along the way, he returned to lend his magic to the Black Panther twice more, producing the classic stories Panther's Quest and Panther's Prey. Perhaps we'll see them collected in a Marvel masterwork soon. Don McGregor is a writer who continues this day to challenge and delight us while validating our essential humanity. Like his work, he's a priceless treasure. The writers who worked at Marvel in the 70s are my cultural touchstone. They informed my world view, not just with stories of action and heroes overcoming odds, but in how they challenged stereotypes, how they destroyed those stereotypes by reminding us that we're all human. We're all people. We're all people with good sides, bad sides, desires, hopes, dreams, and failures. Don McGregor imbued his characters, every one of them, even the villains, with dignity, a sense of purpose, and a reason for being in the story. And then on top of that, he had great action stories. But then, 
as almost a third level he would put in social commentary he would put in poetry he would put in musings when I got to read the Travis McGee novels years later I didn't think that Don McGregor had taken that idea from Travis McGee I thought that he had used that idea to further inform his writing to make it even better to make it resonate more to make it more than just a disposable 32 page piece of pulp that you read and throw away or put in a plastic bag and put in a box to molder away forever Don gave his stories humanity and it's one of the reasons why in any medium Don McGregor is one of my favorite writers and anytime I hear that Don McGregor has something new on the stands it's a joy and a treasure what I recommend for you as a reader first pick up the Black Panther masterwork it's Marvel masterwork the Black Panther it's a little harder to find now because it's been out for a long time and it's out of print normally I would recommend the essentials and there is an essential Black Panther but it is worth more than the, than the masterwork because it came toward the end of the essential run but do yourself a favor and pick up the masterwork for the essays for the for all of the extra material and just because you're going to read it over and over and over again each time discovering a new layer each time discovering a new piece that will touch you in a different way it's one of those things where the story doesn't change but you do so what you get out of what you put into it and what you take out changes as you read it I would recommend the Kill Raven Essential except for the printing so bad but if you can find it the Marvel graphic novel number five Kill Raven that is highly recommended not just for Don McGregor at the height of his writing power but for P. Craig Russell taking that quantum leap forward in his art going beyond a regular comic book artist to what I feel is very classic art. The Nathaniel Dusk miniseries pick that up you're going to enjoy that the Zorro stuff if it's available in trade paperbacks I don't know if it is anymore or not I know that at one point Topps was putting them out and then there was another company that was printing them but those are the ones to pick up and read those are the ones to let you know just how good he was and then if they ever get this saber continuation and a trade paperback collecting it all Saber's at the top of the pack because Saber is where Don poured his heart out into a comic series because he owned it. And here's the thing. Most creators, when they own something, they treat it better. The characters mean more. And I won't deny that Don put a lot of his heart into Saber because he owned it. But if you read Black Panther and Kill Raven and the other characters he wrote that other people owned, within an issue... They're Don's characters. He has found their voice, and someone else may own the rights, but he owns that character. I don't read a Black Panther story without comparing it to Don McGregor, and usually it comes up lacking. I don't read a Kill Raven story without comparing it to what Don McGregor did, and it always comes up lacking. I don't even like Zorro. But I love Don McGregor's Zorro stories. And that's why I highly recommend that you seek out Don McGregor's work and see why he deserves that, that award that he won a couple of weeks ago. I want to thank you for listening. We are in the summer of podcasting. That's right. All summer long, I'm putting out two podcasts a week. One episode of Crazy Comics and Stories and one episode of Solitaire Rose Radio. we got a lot of good stuff coming up. We've got Jack Kirby next week. We've got Tales from the Crypt. We're going to continue going through the EC stuff with Tales from the Crypt and Mad. And I'm also looking at doing some series retrospectives where I go through not kind of indexing and telling you why a short run series is a lot of fun and why you should dig in those back issues and in those bargain bins to pick up these short run series that maybe haven't gotten a lot of love from the reprints or maybe haven't gotten a lot of love from comic fandom at large. I appreciate the emails I've gotten. I've gotten some wonderful emails. It's fun that people are picking up on the things that I enjoy and they're sending me news about um, 
about Twin Peaks. They're sending me news about what David Lynch is up to. They're sending me news about the things that I enjoy that they enjoy as well. I really appreciate that. I also enjoy the emails where you tell me what I'm doing right, but more importantly, what I'm doing wrong and what I can do to improve, what I could do to make this podcast better. Because I do this podcast because there's information in my head that I want to get out, and if I can do it better, I want to. We run advertising right here. Pretty much every form of entertainment has advertising, and this one is no different. Our first ad is for DreamHost.com. DreamHost.com is the best web host in the whole known universe. I've been using them for 14 years. They've always been able to help. They have great services. If you need a web page, they are the best. Just go to DreamHost.com, and if you use the code CRAYZ, that's K-R-A-Y-Z, you get $20 off your first year. Our second advertiser is Graze.com. Graze.com is healthy snacks delivered right to your door so that when you're at work, you can avoid the vending machine. When you're home, you don't have to reach for the bag of chips. It's dried fruit. It's new ideas. Uh, I, I get it every two weeks, but you could get it more often. Great food at a great price. And if you use the reward code, Corey S. 3R5P, your first and fifth boxes are free. That's C-O-R-Y-S-3R-5P. And if you're listening to this here podcast, you're one of the most good-looking people on the internet. And you don't want to trust your skin to just any old razor, so shave with the amazing razors you get from Dollar Shave Club. Every month they send a box with your shave supplies at the beginning of the week, or whenever you want, you can pop in a fresh blade and get that fresh blade shave. It feels fantastic and it's just one of the many ways that you can maintain the good looks that everyone has come to expect from you. That's Dollar Shave Club. If you go to dollarshaveclub.com slash crazy, it kicks a little back. All of these advertisers, they kick a little back to us so we can wet, wet our beak a little. We're not asking for much. We're not asking you for money. But if you need these things, go to our advertisers. They support this podcast. Thanks. The advertising makes this a little more worth it. It helps pay the bills, and it lets me wet my beak a little. So if you want to visit those advertisers, please do. If you have any questions, anything you want me to speak about, any topics that you think would fit Solitaire Rose Radio, or if you're a comic creator or know a comic creator who's got something coming up or an interesting story, just email me at cory.strode at gmail.com, subject Solitaire Rose Radio. We're going to keep going. We're heading on to episode 50. So I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. Please put up some reviews on iTunes. Put up some reviews on, on other websites about podcasts. And you know what? Tell everybody you know about this podcast. Word of mouth is the best advertising there is. If you like this, let other people know. I'll be back next week with more stories. <laughs>